Well, thanks for being on, Jonathan. For those of you who don't know, Jonathan Bechtel is the Chief Operating Officer at the Foundation for Government Accountability. And with everyone working virtually, uh, I thought it'd be good to do an interview with Jonathan just to help understand the best practices of working remotely. Um, at the Foundation for Government Accountability, they have 32 staff who all but two work remotely. Um, so they've had a lot of experience over the years on what works, what doesn't, you know, how to use Zoom efficiently, um, all these things that we're kind of learning on the fly this last week or two. Um, so thanks for being on the show, Jonathan. Sure, it's my pleasure. Thanks, Trevor. So you guys have been growing FGA over the last eight years. You've added on more and more people based all around the country. Uh, what's the number one thing people who are running and leading remote teams now need to be thinking about? Yeah, I think it's a really great question. And one, obviously, that a lot of people are facing all of a sudden that they weren't planning to. And I think that if I had to pick just one thing, it comes down to you have to be really deliberate about communication. And what I mean by that is in an office environment, often you kind of fill in the gaps of communication by having a hallway conversation or being able to kind of read body language in a meeting. There's just so much communication that happens um, just sort of naturally in that environment. When you go remote, you remove most of that. And so all the communication it has to be just a lot more deliberate. I actually think after doing this for a number of years that you can have in some ways better communication in a remote environment because you have to be deliberate, but it is something where you have to be thoughtful. You have to actually reach out to people. There's a lot more, more you have to be proactive about in order to create good communication. Otherwise, folks will just tend to feel isolated pretty fast and you won't know what's going on with people either. And what would you say is like the first two or three steps someone should be doing where they've shifted from in-person environment to remote environment in the last week to enhance the communication? Yeah, I think there's a couple of things they should do pretty quickly. One is uh, you mentioned video before. I think it is really important for people to see each other on video soon. So that could be something like um, a weekly check-in on video with the whole team. If it's not huge or if you have a lot of folks, maybe it's a couple different teams, but letting people kind of quickly get a chance to see each other and feel that human connection. And then another thing that is pretty basic is just start picking up the phone and checking in with people and asking them how they're doing. Because again, you've moved out of an environment where you can notice if someone is having a problem. And so now you have to ask in order to find that out. And people tend to suffer in silence. Uh, they don't want to bother you. They figure they can just deal with it. Um, things that you'll find out things you wished you had known. Um, and so if you just pick up the phone and kind of call through your folks or have your managers do that, um, it's a good way to just check in, ask them how it's going, ask them if they've had any problems that like you have to probe a little bit, but you want to just start talking to people and asking them questions um, to get that kind of feedback that you're going to miss. Right. I think that's such a great point, especially with all the uncertainty right now, like finding out how their household is, you know, is their spouse being laid off or something else? Like all of these really important context um, on knowing how their work's going to be going over the next couple of weeks. Yeah, it'd be so natural right now to call and just check in and see how they're doing. And my guess is on every one of those calls, you'll learn something you didn't know about what the person is thinking, what they're feeling, how clear they are on what their tasks are in front of them. You know, whatever it might be, you'll learn something new uh, and, and establish some better communication. Yeah. So you wrote this interesting piece um, on LinkedIn over the weekend, um, and then we were able to cross post it on the seven figure fundraising blog um, about working remotely. And you had four big facts uh, or big points about what people should be doing while working remotely. Do you want to share those four points and let us, and we'll dive into them a little deeper than just the article goes into. Sure. Be happy to. Um, so the four things that came to mind, I was just trying to think about what would I have wanted to know if I had to go, virtual and do it over again. So the four things I came up with, the first one is just the video point of use video. Uh, even if it feels awkward at the beginning, just use it and you know, gave some tips on how you could pull that off. Um, the second one is about fighting um, micromanagement with transparency and how important transparency is and creating ways for folks to see what other people are doing in new ways uh, in a virtual environment. The third one was to focus on outcomes. So 
you're going to have to worry a lot less about how people get their jobs done, when exactly they get them done, um, but instead ramp up the focus and the clarity for them on just the outcomes of making sure that, that the job does get done, even if it's done a little bit differently now. And the last one was just a couple of ideas around leveling the playing field, because I recognize that some people might still have a few people in the office and then everyone else is at home. And it's easy to sort of have two different cultures or have people feel left out um, if there are some people in the office and some people out of it. So there's a couple of things you can do to make people feel like that they all have the same playing field. and They're kind of all in it together. That's great. So let's dive into the first one. I know we talked about it a little bit already with video, uh, but talk to us about the best practices you have found. You guys use Ring Central and that uh, uses Zoom. Is that correct? That's right. Yeah, we use Ring Central, which right they use the Zoom platform for the video part of what they do. And I know some other groups are using things like Microsoft Teams or Google Hangouts. Uh, it honestly doesn't matter as much to me which one you use. I think it's just really important to use it. It might seem like you can get by with phone calls and conference calls, but there's so much better connection when you have the video. It'll feel a little awkward at first, but you just got to dive in and do it. Um, the, the one thing with that is important, though, is that you do pick some uh, which one you're going to use and make sure that people know how to use it. Um, and, and that might require checking in with your folks and you know, testing it with them and just ensuring that they all feel comfortable with it. Especially what I found when we first started using video was people, the first step was being able to get on and to participate, but then actually creating their own video call was a, was a, another step that I thought was natural, but for some people they needed a little bit of handholding to, to do that. Um, but you want them to be able to, cause you want them to have their own video call. So you have to do a little bit of training with people and just pick one, you know, video uh, provider and, and stick with it. So what about like all of our existential fear of seeing ourselves on video? How do you address that? Yeah, right. That's a great question. I actually just found a new uh, way to, to deal with that. Uh, if you're using the Zoom platform and maybe other ones do as well, you can actually turn off seeing yourself um, on video, which is way less distracting. But there's something about once you get on known that years ago, right? <laughs> it's actually been really uh, transformational. But something about just being on and everyone else has their video on mm -hmm. helps you get over that fear pretty quickly of like you're all in it together. You see that everyone else has their dog in the background too, right? Like there's just you can quickly kind of get over the awkwardness um, once you're all doing it the same way um, and once you're all on, which is why it's important to make sure everyone feels like that they all know how to do it and can get on and can be successful, you know, doing the video. Mm -hmm. And are you guys pretty strict on like meeting start on time? Like everyone's muted. Like how do you handle some of these like really specific logistics issues with everyone joining a video call when you have a big team? Yeah. I thought about that a little bit because we've kind of created practices over time and didn't have lots of points in time where we said, okay, here's the ground rules. Here's how we do it. It's just people sort of learned over time. A lot of these companies uh, and nonprofits that are dealing with this now don't have that luxury of time. And so one of the things I suggest in the article is I would go ahead and create some ground rules and, and just set them out for people. So something like, you know, when you jump on, go ahead and mute yourself so that that one person with the, the loud noise in the background doesn't ruin the call for everyone. Um, make sure you get on two minutes, at least two minutes early, because if you, if you have a technical difficulty, which often happens, especially at the beginning, uh, you may need two to five minutes to fix that. So maybe five minutes is better. Like, I think it would be useful for uh, folks to go ahead and just set some ground rules because they got to make this work fast. Um, and so that will just help people to know those expectations. And do you guys have any rules on like, calls with so many people, we mute everybody, or do you have guidelines around that? Or is it kind of case by case? Yeah, again, we, we haven't because we've sort of learned over time, but I think it would be, uh, it's probably a useful thing to do. And I'm, this is actually making me rethink a little bit of maybe creating more guidelines for new people as they come in. Um, it's, it's definitely one of those things where the mute does break up the conversation. If everyone's on mute and there's only three of you or four of you, Mm -hmm. then the unmute, say something, mute does make it kind of choppy and reduces right. the comfort level. So we have started recently to, with small groups, let's say five or less, to just encourage folks to not be on mute so that they can just free flow the conversation. I think if you get a whole lot more than five, definitely up to 10, 
uh, then it starts to become just, even if everyone is just making a little bit of noise, it starts to be a little overwhelming. And so it's probably time to then switch to have everyone mute themselves. Right. That makes a lot of sense. And one of the shortcuts I just found out uh, actually earlier today was the whole, you can unmute yourself for a second on Zoom or for a brief period by just holding down the space bar on Zoom. Um, and then that unmutes you just for a second. So if you have a quick comment, you don't have to try to find the toolbar and all that. That's right. And I think if someone is leading a meeting, they shouldn't feel shy about when you're on Zoom, and I'm sure this is true for the other ones too, if you're the host, you can mute everyone else one at a time. Uh, I know on Zoom, you right click on their, their picture and you can mute them. Like you should do that if they seem to be unaware and they're bothering everyone, like you need to take control of the call um, or just ask everyone like say, hey, you know, everyone needs to mute. Don't let it go on because it just annoys people and everyone else would be grateful that you took action. Uh, in the same way we were talking before about turning off your own uh, your own screen of your, your picture of yourself. So you're not distracted. That's also something you just right click on uh, in zoom on your picture and you can remove yourself uh, from the screen. So that distraction won't be in front of you of what your hair looks like or whatever that day. <laughs> right. Yeah. We're always so self-conscious on that. Uh, so talk to us a little bit. You have this interesting rule you call the professor Kelly rule. What's that? And tell us about it. Yeah, so probably a lot of people remember there was this uh, YouTube clip that went around of a guy, a Professor Kelly, on a BBC uh, news channel where he was being very professional, giving uh, some type of news media report. I don't remember what it was. And his two-year-old like walks in behind him, and you can see his wife like dragging the kid out behind him. And he yeah, maintains the walker a comes straight in face well, all right. the way through. Yeah, it's phenomenal. If you YouTube uh, just search Professor Kelly. Uh, interview. It's, it's fantastic viewing. But so the rule though that comes out of that is one where we just give express permission to everyone to that we're okay with a kid wandering by or a dog coming in um, or their wife, you know, needing to ask me a quick question. Obviously there's limits to that and everyone sure. needs to be attempting to, to prevent distractions. But um, I think especially in a moment like this, when people are trying to maintain connections, uh, you know, getting to see someone else's dog and share your dog, like might be a little bit of a bonding moment that helps bring some normalcy back. So essentially the rule is don't try to make everyone be perfect, recognize they're all in their homes. Um, and it's really fine to have a distraction here or there, or to see a little glimpse of the rest of their life behind them in the camera um, and not, not make that too big of a deal. Well, and I think it's also important just explicitly stating this, you know, like it, people right. probably I think, you have to think actually that's the norm. Right. right. Right, because everyone is horrible. I mean, certain personalities, especially, probably are screaming at their kids right before they get on the call, and you know, don't touch the door, kind of thing. And so, I think you I thought we would ever do that, of course. Oh, you know? Never, I've never done that. <laughs> but there are people like that, right? Yes. <laughs> um, so, talk to us about how transparency uh, fights micromanagement, because I thought this is one of the really fascinating points of your article that you wrote. And I hadn't thought about it this way because um, our team is only partially virtual, but dive into that because um, I think you have some really good points here. Um, yeah, no, I think it's something we've again had to learn over time, but here's the concept. If I'm used to managing people in an office environment where I can really check in on them, I can walk by their office, we can have quick meetings, um, suddenly losing that ability to check in with people I think the natural response there is to feel a lack of control or a loss of control. Like, I don't know what my people are doing. I'm used to checking in on them. So I'm going to ask them for a lot or I'm going to bug them or I'm going to require, you know, a daily check-in email or something like that, that really starts to stray into micromanagement of folks. Um, and it often can be around things like how they do their job of, are my people actually in the office? I can hear their kid in the background. Are they really working? Like those kinds of thoughts start to creep in. And I think that can be really devastating uh, or destructive for a manager mm -hmm. when they, that's what they're thinking about. And it can send this huge signal of a lack of trust for employees when what you want to do, right, is at least uh, to, to, to have some trust to start with there and then um, focus instead on, on kind of the outcomes. But anyway, so the I think the antidote to that, that micromanagement or that sense of loss of control is to promote transparency however you can. Uh, so one of the ways that this actually looks is through, uh, you know, 
um, systems. A lot of folks are familiar with things like Basecamp or Microsoft Teams or Slack or any one of those systems where there's this shared conversation or shared environment that the company is on. And the point of using that, um, something like that, is to create that transparency where if I'm a manager, I have a way that I can kind of see what people are doing in a non-creepy way. Um, right. I can see what they're doing without having to call or nag or check in. And I can also see what other people in the company are doing um, because they're being transparent. They're talking about openly what's going on, what their projects are, what they're dealing with. You can kind of see the flow of work. Um, and that just helps sort of the stress to go down of, I don't have to micromanage. I can see what's going on. Um, if I'm really curious about what this other team is doing, I can go look at it. So that can take a while to create that, but I think that that could be jump-started with some pretty simple things that a, a leader could do, such as uh, you know, maybe at the end of the week, having a weekly roundup of sort of the biggest things that happen that week that get posted in a public place like a, uh, you know, a Dropbox or Basecamp or something that's shared. Um, something where you know, maybe having that weekly call where people share what happened with them, but looking for ways to just create transparency so that there's less of this sense of a lot, lack of control or loss of control. All right. That's really interesting. How do you avoid like the issue with when people are posting all of their work and it's like in this open setting, how do you avoid like shifting over to like the realm of, you know, Ray Dalio or this like radical transparency where it sometimes can cause problems where people are, other employees are monitoring each other's work. Like, how do you avoid that? Yeah, I think some of that would probably stray into just what kind of culture you have built right. in your organization, hopefully, that if you have don't have people that are too paranoid in that way. But I think that is where the managers are important of some of this is like for us, each team, what transparency means to them looks a little bit different. Mm -hmm. And each of our teams does have some workspaces that are only transparent to that team. So they can have a bit of a division there. Of Sometimes there are just things that really are more of matter to that team, but would just be a distraction to everyone else to have to watch this uh, you know, long conversation. It's kind of like a group chat that you don't want to be on anymore, right? It just keeps going and distracts you. So I think it is helpful for teams to have more of some closed environments. They can do some of that, but have the default for things that don't need that kind of closed environment to be transparent. So you, I think it is important to not say, oh, everything needs to be transparent, um, but that there's a default toward that and then allow them to have a space that's probably kind of team specific for things that not that need to be confidential, but that's just that are not relevant to everyone else. Right. And keep everyone focused on what their team's doing, not the rest of the organization. Yeah. But there's, there is a positive in that too of I'm astonished how often someone who you wouldn't think is relevant to a conversation, but because they can see what's happening, will suddenly jump in and say, Hey, did you think about this? So for instance, there might be a lot of conversation around preparing a government affairs person for meetings with legislators in a particular mm -hmm. state. Doesn't really involve development staff, but because the development team can see it, if they suddenly think about the fact that there's a big donor prospect who lives in that city that's really interested in that you know, legislative happening in that state, they could chime in and say, hey, would you have time for 15 minutes to meet with this donor? Um, and create that extra value from that trip mm -hmm. that might otherwise not be there. And so it, it's, it's amazing sometimes how often there's really good things that come out of collaboration when there's a lot of transparency. Right. And you get different sets of eyes, different sets of skill sets looking at the problem. Right. So we've used um, Basecamp in the past and um, we use it with our company. How do you overcome this challenge? That I think a lot of organizations have when they start using a system like Basecamp with getting, you always have like the super users who use it all the time. And then you have the people who like, you have to drag kicking and screaming uh, to use the system. How do you guys overcome that? And how do you essentially force everyone to use it? Uh, or it sounds like you guys do. Right, no, we've moved to a place where almost all the internal communication is on Basecamp for us. And there's very little that happens through email or text or anything like that. Um, I think that you have to take some deliberate steps. This goes back to my point at the beginning about deliberate communication of not just allowing things to happen, but this is one of those things where you got to take some deliberate steps to it. And I think the first one is to lead by example. 
if you're going to ask your folks to use an online platform of some kind or begin using Slack in this, you know, in this time period or whatever or video, you can't be the one that doesn't do that. Like you right. as the CEO or the EVP or whatever, you guys have to do that too and lead by example and show uh, that you're willing to make that kind of a change as well. So I think that's the first thing. The second thing is you want to make it a useful place for people to go, not just to check the box. So think about what are the kinds of information that people need normally and how can you move some of that information to that, to that system, to base camp or whatever it is. So for us, like that was looked like us building a, a company headquarters uh, spot on base camp that had the staff calendar and the holidays and uh, you know, the needed forms and all the like latest publications and just what are all those things that employees wish they could find and are always kind of trying to figure out where they are. If you put them all in one spot, then you create a bit of this incentive for people to come there. And if you then have a shared, uh, a shared habit of when someone asks you for something, if it's there, of having this mantra of, well, I can give it to you, but it's also on Basecamp and here's how you find it. And having some shared, like those super users, you wanna solicit them to help you with that of when they get asked for something, don't just give it to someone, show them how to find it on this platform and help them feel like that they can you know, see where it is. I think you also just have to do training. Some people mm -hmm. just have a, uh, are not great with technology. Yeah. They struggle with into new technology, right. Yeah, and so they need, a one-on-one, -on -one, someone walking them through it to feel comfortable and not feel stupid. Um, and I think you have to recognize that you have some of those people on your team and it's not because they don't want to do it. It's just because they don't know how or just right. feels so different for them. So those are three things that I would think about of lead by example, begin making it valuable for people, not just say you have to use this, but how can the company make it worth their time to get on it? And then um, give training to people. And it's probably needs to be one-on-one -on -one training, not mass training, because you'll lose those people. They won't say anything because they don't want to feel stupid, but they won't know how to do it and they'll just won't use it. So you got to kind of do the one-on-one -on -one mm -hmm. stuff with people to help them. And do you guys, did you pick a specific date to start like, okay, from this point on, we're going to do it this way? Like, how did you make that jump from email? Because most organizations, they do, you know. Most of them do. Yeah. And email is just incredibly non-transparent. So right. uh, it, it's, it's a problem. Right. And often what you'll have is half the people will use your base camp or whatever your system is. Mm -hmm. The other half just use email and so inconsistent. So we hit that point of where we'd gotten everyone on, we had done the things I talked about and that'll get a lot of people using it, mm -hmm. but there was still some folks that didn't uh, and there was still a lot of inconsistency. So we, we actually, this little thing called, we call it a base camp week uh, challenge where for one week, no one could use email internally. They had to use Basecamp. Uh, and it actually was really successful more than I thought it would be. I wasn't sure how it would work out. It, there was some little complaints here and there, but what people I think discovered, and I heard this over and over again, is I thought I didn't like Basecamp, but when I had to be on for a week, I realized, oh, I actually can do this. It is really helpful. And so the level of, of adoption probably doubled after that week and never went backwards again. So it didn't get everyone to hundred percent, but probably got everyone to like 50%. And a lot of people, you know, maybe bumped up to 75%. So something kind of drastic like that, when we hit that point of diminishing returns where we just really weren't gaining a lot more adoption, um, then we did something like that that was a little more drastic. Well, and this is a good time for organizations that have wanted to have more transparent communications or use a platform like this. There's so much change going on anyway. People are working from home. If you're used to working in an office, you can kind of use this as a good opportunity for people to take advantage and do something like this. Yeah, I know a lot of organizations that they do use something like Basecamp, but only maybe one department uses it or they've struggled to get more people to, to use it. I totally agree. This is the perfect opportunity when everyone will understand why you're suddenly going to make a push for, we got to get everyone on. So we all know what we're doing and are transparent, like seize the moment. This is, it probably is a good moment to do things like that. Right. So switching gears just a little bit, um, your third point where you say focus on outcomes, um, how do you guys manage that? Yeah. So this kind of goes back to, um, you know, I, last time we had, had a podcast, we talked a bit about our structure and our systems. Mm -hmm. A lot of it is designed around how do you, um, how do you re 
attract and retain top talent. And one of the things that really talented people uh, appreciate and love is flexibility. It's a, it's a really valuable commodity these days that people look for. Um, and it's why you know, we even went distance uh, remote in the first place was to give people flexibility. So flexibility is gonna be the name of the game now for everyone else who has to suddenly be remote because people are juggling their kids, they're juggling you know, trying to find food at the grocery store. Like there's so many things that may get, may get worse. Um, so focusing on outcomes rather than how someone does their job um, is practical, but it also is what really top people want anyway of, okay, tell me what you want me to accomplish. Tell me how it should look when I'm done, like the deliverables, but then give me the freedom as the employee to figure out how I get there. And trust me that I can figure it out. Um, or if I don't, then I'll ask you. And I think people that um, are talented folks that are motivated, they will rise to, the, to that occasion and will really appreciate that. I think the other thing is when you're separated in your own homes and trying to work on whatever you see in front of you, it's easy to get kind of myopic of just what my tasks are and what I need to get done. And there's a, a big value there of kind of helping people just stay focused on the big picture of, I may be alone in my you know, bedroom in front of my desk trying to do my little thing, but I'm really actually part of a group of people that are all working together toward a big cause. Um, and that's a really valuable feeling for them to keep. But you'll have to, like that has to be um, cultivated and it has to be kind of repeated over and over again to help people maintain that, that kind of a big picture. So they don't get just sort of stuck in the drudgery of I'm all alone and you know, trying to do my little thing. And I don't know if what I'm doing is really helpful or not. So two pieces of that one is focusing on results rather than how, but then the second thing is making sure that everyone keeps the big picture in mind of what we're all working toward, why it matters, you know, that there's uh, an optimism and hope and, and value in what you're doing every day. So I think both of those things are really important in a time like this. So how do you avoid this tendency with like high performers to become workaholic? So one of the things I noticed when I used to work from home five or six years ago, and I now have an office that's really near my house. Uh, but one of the things I liked about the switch to the office environment was you had a break and you had clear boundaries on where work was and where home was. How do you work with your people on establishing those, you know, when, your office might be in your bedroom or your spare room or, you know, somewhere in your house. Yeah, it's a really great point. I think that starts with deciding what, what the culture of your company is in, in regards to that. Like, are you a place that values people, you know, working a lot and long hours and just kind of always being on? Um, and some organizations are like that. And I think that if they are, then like embrace that. But I think you're talking more about organizations where they would probably say that they want to create a work-life balance and want to make sure people don't work all the time or travel so much that they, you know, lose their marriage or whatever. Right. And so I think there it's, it's honestly an ongoing thing that has to be a conversation. But one of the things we talk about a lot, especially at the leadership level at FGA is being really careful about making sure that the the signals we send as leaders line up with what we're telling people. So if we're telling people, this is a place where we value families, we don't want you to work every night and on the weekend, except for the really occasional moment when it actually is absolutely necessary. And in order to win, we're gonna do it, but that's not gonna happen very often. If that's what we say, then we can't as leaders be posting on Basecamp at 10 p.m. You know, every night or sending emails um, on Sunday afternoon, even if, and we've fallen in this trap before, even if that post or that email says, hey, you don't have to respond to this until Monday morning. I just want you to know before I forget, like that's what we do. But it's easy to forget when that's received. There's just no way yeah, no one ignores that, that, that right. people will ignore it. That's right. Mm -hmm. And it still sends a signal of you don't have to work on money, but I am and I'm important. And so if you ever want to be important, you got to do this too it's those really powerful hidden signals. So that's the conversation we have all the time of, we have to not send the wrong signal. And then we ourselves have to set up boundaries, you know, for ourselves with our, in our homes. So I think that's important of just little things for folks if they're starting out remote and trying to figure this out of 
what kind of boundaries can you create for yourself? Can you close the door when you have office hours and make sure that, you know, there's some separation there, or even just the act of I'm closing the door, I'm going to work right now, but when I'm done, I'm going to open the door, turn off my computer, put my phone down, you know, shut down my browser and be done. And I'm not going to have my phone next to me at the dinner table or things like that. That'll really just suck me back in. So it's really, I think both those things matter of leadership signals and then the individuals thinking through a plan for creating their own sort of physical boundaries uh, in their, in their environment. Right. I think having like a, both like kind of a powering up routine, like where you start work in the day where you kind of go through a similar cycle or, you know, a series of steps, and then at night, I, and that for me personally, it's more important even in the evening is a way you wind down from work. You know, like sometimes it's really hard to close your laptop and then 15 seconds later be dealing with screaming kids who are hungry and tired, you know, like, um, so do you guys encourage people to try to do that or kind of people to figure that out on their own or how do you address that? Yeah, I think it's one of those things that it goes back to that one-on-one communication of just mm-hmm. trying to figure out what is working for people. Because the thing you don't want to do is just miss the fact that sometimes there are people that are just way better in the evening. And so their mm-hmm. preference would be to start a little later. Maybe they you know run some errands in the middle of the day, but they are high producers from 6 to 10 p.m. And so you don't want to shut that down because that's part of the value, honestly, of a remote mm-hmm. environment and giving people flexibility. But you can't just assume that if you see people working late, you have to have that conversation with them of, are you working late because you can't turn it off or are you working late because you've right. chosen to have later working hours and it's, you're, you know, you're still sort of balancing life work. Um, and if they are, then, then you can decide if that you know makes sense. And if that seems like that, that works out well, but you shouldn't just assume mm-hmm. what's going on with people. Yeah. And what I like about this article and like your approach is, you know, you have these like broad organizational rules, but then you dive in specifically with each person to make sure it works for them. Um, it's not like kind of a one size fits all. So talk about to us about this last point on leveling the playing field. Sure. So this kind of goes back a bit to the video uh, piece, but it goes even beyond that of when you have uh, in office culture and then you also have a few remote workers or now in this case, maybe it's a few office people and a lot of remote workers. If you have both environments, they will normally not be the same. And I'll illustrate this by, so the classic example is you have five or six people in the office sitting around a conference phone and you have five people remote who are calling into that conference phone. We all know what that's like when you're on the phone. You can only hear part of the conversation. Side conversations happen that you don't know about. Like you're kind of a second class citizen in that, mm-hmm. in that conference right. room. So that in a microcosm is what happens. So the most common complaint when you, you know, when there's been surveys done of remote workers is that they feel like they're left out of a lot of things that happen in the office. And so it, it requires a really deliberate approach to thinking about how do we make sure that people don't feel left out mm-hmm. and then we create a level playing field. So one way to do that is with video, even if there are still say three people left in the office, they should all sit at their own desks and be on video single by themselves, not as three in a group, just so everyone on video is exactly the same, right? We all are in front of our one video camera. Nobody has their own little kind of side meeting Uh, that people can see. So that concept, but also even thinking about equipment of, let's say the people in the office have access to, you know, nice headphones and a nice webcam and all the, you know, people in their their homes are like trying to scramble and make do. Like, could you as an organization buy everyone that same webcam uh, to Mm -hmm. be in their home or at least something that's nice so that they feel like that they're being treated just the same as the folks in the office. So it's a lot of little things um, if, if you in the office have, uh, you know, snacks around, like last week when we had a meeting, uh, we got on Amazon and maybe now you can't do this, but, uh, we sent a little snack box to everyone's home so that when they're on the meeting with us, they could have snacks too. Cause that's what would happen in the office. So trying to signal in all these little ways of you are just as important. We're going to try to create just as good of a, like a office environment for you at your house as you might've had here. So 
if folks are being temporary right now, there might be only some of those things they can do. Right. But thinking that way, it's a mindset of we're going to try to make this as equal of an of a environment as we can. If they're doing it longer term, then you can do more things like we, we buy everyone the same office chairs that we have in the office at the same level, the same level of desks, the same level of computers, like try to make it where they don't get you know, shorted because they're working from home. Right. That makes a ton of sense. And like by intentionally buying desks and those sort of things, it's not like this weird thing where you're trying to cobble it together the day you start work. You know, right. it's like, it feels nice to get something delivered you're putting together or a new laptop and those sort of things. Yeah, it feels like you're actually starting a new job, even though you're still in your living room. You know, or right. whatever. Yeah. So last week you had your annual staff or your quarterly staff meeting had to switch from being in person to virtual uh, and you're a virtual company. What was that like where you had to do all day on Zoom? What were there any lessons learned as a final question for you? Yeah, it's a, uh, it's a good question. I was honestly a little terrified by the thought of eight hours on video because you feel dr emotionally drained. It feels like pretty right. fast on video um, and not having that in-person environment. But we had to do it. We couldn't travel. And so mm -hmm. I think a couple of things I learned. One, it's not as bad as I thought it was if you, um, with some like simple things. So one of them, which is kind of obvious, is taking breaks pretty often. But we did the whole thing I mentioned before of having everyone off of mute, um, and have their video on. So we all were participating. We could this is for about really, five people or so. Yes, five people. So yep. it's a small enough group to do that. And then when we took a break, we had everyone shut off their video and mute themselves. So we all could take a break and mm -hmm. you know, there wasn't a little cross talk. To. Right. Yeah. Uh, right. There's it doesn't there's nobody's meeting while one person is out of the room, right? We made sure that didn't happen. Um, and then uh, the other thing was just recognizing that it would take a lot of preparation to be ready for it, especially on the technology side. So in a, in a room, you can, you know, bring a, a bunch of handouts and just be able to sort of, you know, hand those out and, and can kind of wing things a little bit more on video. I, I spent hours ahead of time making sure that I had every single piece of paper I might need was uploaded, was linked. It was all on one agenda so that I didn't have to, spend lots of time trying to, I need to email this out or share my screen and try to find it. I tried to be as prepared as I could um, in mm -hmm. advance so that it, with everything being digital and ready for everyone to just look at and grab onto, um, even to the point of sharing a spreadsheet so I could take notes and everyone else could see the notes at the same time um, with it. So we had very little technology issues, which if you have a lot of those or if people can't see something, right? Uh, then I think that really, makes it harder but i so that preparation helps so i think just thinking over prepare uh, when you're going to do a video thing like that and we split the eight hours up into three different about two and a half hour sessions over two days so there was okay. a lot of kind of breaks built into it and i think that helped a lot and with those two and a half hour sessions that you had breaks built into those as well yeah inside of them as well that's right maybe five or ten minutes inside of them yeah and how often did you do those which did you find worked well um, so we did like one session, then took a half hour or an hour long break. And then oh, okay, so long break um, in the middle of the two of them. Right. So people actually had time to go and do something real and then come back um, to it. So it, it felt like you had a real break. Yeah. Right. Okay. That's good to know. Cause I was thinking, envisioning more like the five minute break and then everyone starts back up. So I think that's an interesting uh, nuance of that. So as a final question for you, Jonathan, uh, you know, we like to have people take action when they listen or watch one of our uh, podcasts or, you know, we're recording this as well as video. Uh, what's the one thing you would recommend for leaders doing to do who are switching to a remote environment, you know, for the next couple of weeks? What's the first thing they should do or the most important thing? You know, I think I would do the check-in calls that we talked about at the beginning. I think I would make, a, you know, create maybe a list of questions around, how their family is doing, how their technology is doing, whether they feel like they're clear on what they're, uh, what they need to work on in the next week. Uh, you know, think through that ahead of time. So you have a list of some good open-ended questions and then just start calling through people. Cause again, I think you'll learn a lot from it. People will appreciate it. Um, you touching base with them and you can get a feel for what are the things you need to work on out of those calls. I think like 
it could be any of the stuff we talked about is something you need to work on, but you won't entirely know that unless you talk to your people. So do the group calls too. I think that's great um, and have uh, you know, that social connection, but the one-on-ones is where you'll actually learn how people are doing and what they're thinking. And then you can respond to that as a leader. Right. And in these times you can't over communicate with your staff. Um, That's right. But you don't always know what to communicate. Like a lot of groups have found, I've talked to, have found it's really helpful to say something about the financial state of the company. Like, how are we doing? Everyone's hearing about stuff, but so they're starting to wonder. So as an organization saying, here's our financial status, here's what our donors are what they're hearing from our donors, you're all going to be okay. As long as that's true. Um, right. People want to hear that, but you know, like it was listening to some of the people that, that made us realize, Oh, they need to hear this from us. Like we just assume they know things are good, but mm-hmm. it turns out we actually needed to say it. And it was because we were you know, hearing from people on the team. Um, so that's the kind of thing where you just don't know which thing you need to tell people or which thing they don't realize that you as the leader might just assume everyone knows. Right. And especially the different age groups, you know, people who are in their thirties or forties have gone through a lot of shocks, you know, right. with nine 11, these sort of things, people in their twenties, this might be the first one, you know, That's kind right. of remembered life. Um, yeah. So it's important. Like you said, just keep communicating because different things resonate with different people. Yeah. But communicating means also asking questions, not just talking to them. So I think it's the, remember to ask questions and see how people are doing. Yep. Right. Absolutely. Well, thanks for being on the show, Jonathan. I really appreciate you doing this and it's always insightful having you on and I appreciate you a taking the time in this busy week, uh, but also sharing what you guys have learned uh, firsthand over the last few years. I'm happy to do it. Thanks for having me on and just let your listeners know if anyone wants to call and chat about something they're working on, trying to figure out with this, I'm always happy to to help somebody out. And you uh, just preempted my question, uh, which is good because I'd forgotten it, but where can people find out more about you, Jonathan, and the Foundation for Government Accountability, and how can they contact you? Yeah, so my email is first initial J, last name Bechtel, B-E-C-H-T-L-E, at thefga.org. Um, I'm sure you, you can add a link to that, um, the, the show notes. So people can email me at that, and I'd be happy to answer any questions they have. Great. Well, thanks for being on the show, Jonathan. Really appreciate it. Thanks for having me.